here on this part on of this street, spot right here on yeah. this i'm a minority owned business and i'm classified as black and then what happens when you step I on the federal a, property i become a non-minority owned business and i'm caucasian i'm caucasian i'm black i'm it, caucasian i'm black in the eyes of the law. in the eyes of the law that's absurd right that the, uh, the idea it's of you then, being then, black and then well then you're saying the law is absurd I'm not absurd. The law is the law. We live by the rule of law. If you're saying I, that this situation is absurd, then that means the rule of law is absurd. Ralph Taylor started his own insurance firm back in 1995. His focus is on risk management, advising companies on how to avoid legal liability. But for the last two years, he's been in a legal battle of his own, fighting to be recognized as a black man. Why did you decide to take a DNA test? I did it just for the understanding and for the knowledge to clarify what my oral history was. And it clarified what I had known through oral history about our lineage and our heritage. My father said we were a mix of many things, which we are. So you, you took a DNA test, and what did the DNA test reveal to you? Uh, Native American, black, and Caucasian. Was it majority Caucasian, majority, majority black, majority, majority Native majority American? Caucasian, majority Caucasian, then Native American, and then black. The uh, black was uh, 4%, around approximately 4% with a 3% variant. 3% margin of error. Yeah. The Native American was 6 or 7%. I can't remember exactly without looking at it, but with a 3%, and then the rest was like 86% Caucasian. The, the rest of it was those two ethnicities, if you want to call them ethnicities. Based on his DNA results, Ralph applied to the Washington State office that certifies minority-owned businesses. He sent in a photo and signed a sworn affidavit stating he was black. Getting certified can be a big deal. Out of around 600,000 small businesses across the state, fewer than 1,500 businesses have this certification. Washington State is trying to level the playing field. Right now, it has a budget of almost $3 billion to spend on business contracts and white-owned businesses get more than six times as much money as black-owned businesses. So it set a target to award more contracts to women and people of color. It sounds like it, it's sort of a, a lucrative thing if you can be certified as a minority business. Very it could, lucrative. How lucrative are we talking? Billions upon billions upon billions of dollars. Ralph applied to have his insurance company certified as minority-owned back in 2014. His application was approved by the state. But that same year, when he tried to get certified for a similar federal program, he was denied by the same office because they said he was not a minority. The person who looked at it, who determined I was black at the state level, looked at it again and said I was Caucasian at the federal level. So to me, that shows there may be some issues of arbitrariness in that. So are you trying to make money out of this or are you trying to make a point? It was never about the money. So if it's not about the money, what point are you trying to make? The point would be to show the country that there is no valid definition of race. You spent hundreds of thousands of dollars all to prove a point that the system is unfair. Wouldn't you? I mean, I don't have hundreds of thousands well, yeah, of dollars to spend. If you had but... It, but if you saw something that you thought was unfair, would you fight? Ralph claims he hasn't benefited monetarily from the program. But Taryn Finley, who writes about the intersection of race and culture for HuffPost, is concerned about this new role DNA is playing, and the idea that genotype, what your genetics reveal, might start to carry the same weight as phenotype, or what you look like. I have maybe about 10% European in me. I'm a black woman. My lived experience as a black woman cannot be passed, you know, that you're, you're playing a game. It's a, in a very nefarious way of, of using your privilege, and I don't think that you're genuinely trying to expose a flaw in the system. Why, what do you mean by that? Um, the fact that you weaponize this 4% against those who could have been eligible for this and actually were marginalized. Your intentions were not to show that the system was flawed. Of course the system is flawed. Like, we know that. Before you took a DNA test, what was your idea of race? What was your own personal experience of race and of, of you know, how people 
treated you racially? I've been told I look Native American, I look darker, and people have always said that I look multiracial. So it's, you know, I'm assuming that Caucasian would be the the highest percentage, but I've always been told I look multiracial. On a job application, on the census, you're asked to tick, you know, what would you classify, what, what was I the race? I cross them all. You cross them all? So you, self, you would cross every single self, one of them? Hispanic, I mean, you cross it out? Hispanic is to embrace the Hispanic culture. So you, so when I, you're I embrace, filling in a census, you tick every I single can, one of them? Whatever I feel like, they're self they're self-identifying statements. So if you want to say that you're Hispanic, you can say you're Hispanic. Being able to um, tiptoe back and forth across a line between, oh, now I'm black, now I'm white, now I'm multiracial, that is not, that's not identity. You can't do that in reverse. Today, more than 26 million Americans have used at-home genealogy kits, and that number is growing. In fact, more people took tests last year than in the previous six years combined. So what happens if DNA starts to define who gains entry into affirmative action programs? There's no legal precedent yet, but it's something sociologist Wendy Roth has been thinking about. Her work looks at how DNA impacts our perceptions of race. How much has you know, the at-home DNA testing kit rise changed your area of expertise and changed your field of study? It's changed it quite a bit. Um, there are so many people now who have taken these tests and have started to say that they're, they feel different than they did before. Either they claim a new identity or they at least are thinking about themselves in a different way or about what race or ethnicity means. And that seems to be very significant because for the most part, we're not all genetic scientists. So, you know, we, we tend to, if we see somebody in a white coat, believe them. And if we see, you know, sending off something to a laboratory and then we get results back, we have been kind of conditioned to put faith in those results, right? Well, I think that there are a lot of people who take these tests and think that they don't really need to think critically about it. Humans share 99.9% .9 of the same DNA. So at-home genealogy kits really only look at a small fraction of our genetic materials. These tests are not very definitive, right? They, they depend on a lot of things. They depend on who is in the company's database. And the databases are different across every company. So you could submit uh, a DNA test from one company, but if the other side of your locked suit were to have you tested with a different company, it could actually show a different result. And does it matter what percentage the test reveals? So in Ralph Taylor's case, the DNA test revealed that he was 4% African American. Does it make a difference that it's 4% versus say 44% or 64%? I think what makes a difference is how the person is seen by others within their community. If the person is seen by others within their community as a white person, then the percentage doesn't matter. But certainly before they took a genetic ancestry test, it's not like that was a factor at all. Now, if this is someone who in some way, there's something about their appearance that makes other people question their race or who they are, and that could have been a factor in how they had been treated historically, then yes, I think it's a question that's open for debate. But in the case of somebody who has a very small percent, like 4%, it's very unlikely that that is going to be visible enough that it's going to influence people's interactions with them. What do you think about the fact that Ralph Taylor is essentially using his DNA tests as a sort of key to be able to access entry into a particular racial group? I think that that is a misuse of these tests. I think that the, the intention behind the kinds of programs that um, give certain consideration to minority-owned businesses or female-owned businesses is to try to address past inequalities. New York Times bestselling author and cultural critic Michael Denzel Smith has examined what it means to be black in America. So I asked him if he thinks DNA tests complicate affirmative action. DNA does not tell, like it's not telling you your race because race is not a biological fact. Race is a social and political like construct. It is something that is lived. These types of programs, what have you, 
are trying to uh, adjust for a specific form of oppression, which has to do with racial like hierarchies, right? So it is the legacy of slavery, the legacy of Jim Crow, the legacy of lynching, the legacy of redlining. Like it is specifically meant to address that. So if you are then a part of a lineage of people that have experienced that, that have been on the other side of that kind of oppression, then that's what should open up these programs. But Ralph doesn't see affirmative action that way and argues racial inequalities don't matter nearly as much as class. Well, we treat people differently on a socioeconomic basis. You've got uh, Condoleezza Rice, and then you've got somebody in South Chicago. They're completely different learned experiences or experiences, but they're perceived as being the same race. It's, it's a socioeconomic. But we still live in a society where, statistically, if the, there's one person who is white and one person who's black, the person who's black is going to be less likely to get that job, less likely to go to college, less likely to be afforded opportunities. You know, this is just sort of the statistics of the time mm -hmm. that we're living in, right? That's a socioeconomic. If they have the... But that's racial, no? It's racial and socioeconomic. Right. I mean, it's, it's all these factors well, there's, mixed together. Yeah, well, there's, again, that's, those are on an individual basis. So I didn't have as many opportunities as someone who comes from a very rich family. I used to live in my car when I was younger, so it's, it's, it's a socioeconomic issue. <sighs> Poverty operates so differently. Economic status operates so differently, depending on what you look like. Mm -hmm. I wish it was that easy and we could all say, like, okay, like, let's break it down by class, but it just doesn't work like that. You are at risk for so many more things when you are a poor person of color rather than a poor white person. And that's just, like, the reality of it. According to a large study this year by researchers at Stanford, Harvard and the Census Bureau, in 99% of neighborhoods, black boys earn less in adulthood than white boys who grow up in families with similar incomes. We know the inequalities that exist along, along racial lines today are tremendous. They're much worse than some other kinds of inequalities, such as some class-based inequalities. We know from a lot of evidence, from a lot of research, that disadvantage over generations is cumulative. The fact that somebody was discriminated against 100 years ago, it doesn't just go away. When I met Ralph in Seattle, he'd recently faced another legal setback. The Supreme Court declined to take up his case, meaning that he's still white in the eyes of the federal government, even if he's black in the eyes of the state. The Ninth Circuit ruled on your case and all three judges ruled against you, determined that you didn't qualify as a socially and economically disadvantaged individual. They said that you considered yourself to be black based on your DNA results and that you joined the NAACP, subscribed to Ebony magazine and had, quote, taken a great interest in black social causes. The, they, they Do you see how that seems a little bit offensive to people who are black? Uh, again, they, uh, they asked, I asked, what is the, the black specific culture that you want to question? Because I asked them, what is the black culture? And they go, well, you, you'll know if you were in it. It's like, well, what is the black culture? Like I said, is it Condoleezza Rice? Is it Snoop Dogg? Is it Dr. Dre? Or is it Ludacris? Or is it Colin Powell? They said something to the effect that if you don't know what it is, it's because you're not black. The OMWBE told us over email that they do not provide comment on specific applications. But when I asked how they decide who's black and who isn't, they said that they no longer require photographic evidence with an application form. But if after reviewing a signed notarized affidavit, OMWBE has a well-founded reason to question the individual's claim of membership in that group, we require additional evidence that they are a member of the group. What we're trying to determine is if you are a part of a class of people, right, that has been discriminated against and therefore you are eligible for the corrective program, right? Uh, but how to, de how to determine, it, it's, it's really, really confusing and tricky to do, right? Because what we're asking then is for you to prove uh, a history of discrimination on the basis of how you look. Right? Like that, that's difficult for anybody to suss out. Well, it's, and it's also, it's like proving one's blackness in a cultural sense. Yeah. Which is, I mean, like, that's what, what, what is like, what Do you is have to go and culture? perform blackness, right? Like, well, it's an interesting point. You should raise that part of the proof that Ralph had given 
Um, he said he had taken a great interest in black social causes, joined the NAACP, mm. and subscribed to Ebony magazine. Yeah, Rachel Dolezal did all those things too. <laughs> Rachel Dolezal, who now goes by in KG Diallo, is a Spokane, Washington woman who sparked outrage in 2015 when it was revealed that she had been posing as a black woman for most of her adult life. Dolezal came under fire nationally for suggesting that you can pick your race. Do you see any parallels between uh, Rachel Dolezal and what you're doing? I wish I could have called her and said, Rachel, all you have to do is identify. You don't have to... There is no definition. Black is having an ancestral background of the continent of Africa. Hispanic is to embrace the Hispanic culture regardless of race. Caucasian is having uh, relatives of Northern Europe, basically. I mean, she's become the touchstone for the idea of, like, not just enjoying black culture, but like wanting to be a part of it to the point of identification. Like the cultural blackness comes in in finding community with people who are sharing that experience with you. There's the common experience that we, like all of our ancestors had of slavery, they formed culture out of that. You have the common experience of segregation, they form culture out of that. And so that culture is continually shifting and changing and we're adopting new fashions, new slang, new music, new movies, all of this like building culture. And you are doing that with people on the basis of shared experience. If you cannot point to your life as a shared experience with those people, then how can you claim that status? Well, they use Obama. He's 50% Caucasian and he's 50% black. He gets to choose. Well, he doesn't get to choose, right? This is the, the point. Society chooses for him because yeah, people are racist yeah, and they're, yeah. putting that, they're putting their preconceived ideas of inferiority and or, and or superiority on someone else. Well, then then, then uh, if you rely on the group to determine who you are, then that's, then that's sad. Ralph told us he plans to apply for federal minority status again later this fall. In the meantime, he's changed his birth certificate to include Native American and black. Some people might sort of say, are you not just trolling everybody? Is this really what you're a, doing? It would be a nice troll though, wouldn't it? I mean, are you trolling everybody? <laughs> no. Do you think that there's a greater good that can be done here? I'm wondering whether or not people will see it that way. Given enough time, once all the facts come out in the next case, then America gets to see that it's, this race thing is being used as a tool. Is he wrong? So... Like, is he wrong like, to check the forms, or is like, he wrong philosophically? The, ultimately, the world that I think most of us would like to live in is one in which none of this matters, right? Like, that we are genuinely looking at other people as human beings, and we can recognize their humanity and care for them on the basis of that alone, right? Like, I think that's the world that we do want to live That's in. That's the utopia. That is the utopia. We do not exist in that place yet.